I'm going to talk about uh, what, how, how Africa is seen, in particular from the outside world, and how we're making measurements of the performance of the internet and what the impacts are and where, where things are going. In particular, what's happening at the moment, of course, is for Africa and for the rest of the world, they've moved from satellites to fiber optic cables, and that's happened as a big time because of the World Cup in the last year. And the little photo in the bottom right shows you the SeaCom cable coming ashore in 2009 in Kenya. Uh, let's see how do oh, here we are. So what I'm going to talk about is why does Africa's internet performance matter? How do we measure the performance, and what do we find? and what's happening in its impact, and what comes next, and then a few conclusions. So why does it matter? Well, in particular, because I'm a scientist, it obviously matters that African scientists are is isolated because they, have criti they lack critical mass. This is something called a cartogram. The areas of the country are related to the metric that we're measuring. In this case, the metric being measured is the number of papers being published in the country. And you can see that North America and Europe have lots of, uh, lots of papers co uh, published, and so does uh, Japan. But if you look in the Southern Hemisphere, it's not so good in South, South America. And when you get to so uh, uh, Africa, it's just the North, uh, North African and uh, South Africa, the only places really which uh, there are many papers coming from. And to publish papers and to do science, one does need networks. And again, you see the networks, this is in terms of the number of internet users in 2002, and again, Africa really sits behind everything. And what you want to do is not only, what, what is happening, of course, is that we are losing, uh, uh, oh, hang on, sorry, one too many, um, the brain, this is a brain drain, people are leaving, you know, getting training outside Africa in many cases, and then not coming back because there's no opportunity. What needs to be done is to turn this lack of opportunity into opportunity and to get a brain gain and to get di uh, tap the diaspora. And also to blend in distance learning and provide leadership and actually train the trainers. So how does the internet help in this? Well, the World Bank a report says that for every 10 percentage points increase in the high-speed internet connections, there's an increase in economic growth of 1.3%. So investment in information technology really plays the role of a facilitator, allowing other innovations to take place. Of course, Africa is huge, it's diverse, and with dreadful access in many places. You could fit the United States, India, Argentina, China, uh, Europe, all into uh, Africa and still leave a little bit of space left. And at the same time, if you look at the uh, picture at the top uh, right, you can see that the fibers covering the world, you can hardly see the only one which was covering uh, Africa at the time, which was down the west coast. And this means very, very poor performance. So what do we do? Well, we have this measuring uh, tool that we use. It just uses standard ping that exists on every computer delivered today. There's a measuring host, which is shown as a laptop at the top left. It sends 10 pings to a remote host, which could be a web server somewhere in the world. The remote host typically responds with the 10 pings, so you get the round trip time to get the packet out and back. Or if the packet didn't come back, you get the loss. And if none of the packets come back, you know the host is probably down, or at least your network is down between there and there and here. Then, once a day, we pick up the information from the monitoring hosts, and there's actually about uh, 70 monitoring hosts around the world, pick it up and put it in the archives, which are at Slack, at Fermilab in Chicago, and in Pakistan. So we have uh, some redundancy there. Okay, so what is the coverage? Uh, this, the little gra uh, map on the right, shows you the little red dots. They're the monitoring stations. There's about 70 in 23 countries, four in Africa, Algeria, Burkina Faso, Egypt, and South Africa at the Tenet site in, uh, uh, near Cape Town. There's 100 beacons. That means beacons are hosts which are monitored by every monitor. And then we're monitoring about 740 remote sites in actually 15, uh, including uh, 50 African countries, and that, that actually includes roughly uh, the total number of countries we're monitoring contain over 99% of the world's population. So here's what the results uh, look like. We have a graph on the right. You'll see it's a log scale. It's the percent loss, and along the bottom you can see the dates starting at 1998 and going through 2010. Losses. You want low losses, so the bottom looks blue, means the better, and the, the, the upper is pink, which is not so good. So, and the losses are mainly at the edges, so the, uh, rather than in the, in the backbone itself. So the losses typically tend to be distance independent, which is very nice. 
So as you can see, these, these, these are measurements uh, averaged over one year for each of the regions of the world. And you can see these, line, these, these wobbly lines are roughly linear if you put a, 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 um, a line through them. So that means that things are improving exponentially. If you look, you can see the black countries, the black regions at the bottom, Europe, North America, Australasia, East Asia, all have uh, packet losses of less than 0.1%. This is seen from North America. You can see there's a second lot of countries like South Asia, uh, Southeast Asia, um, Latin America, which uh, have, have losses uh, like from one to uh, uh, less than 1%. And then Africa and Central Asia have losses of uh, over 1%. What we can do is we can actually measure the round trip time, which I mentioned we've got, and also measure the loss. And from this, knowing how uh, TCP works, we can get a rough, rough estimate of the derived uh, of the throughput, which is roughly the size of a packet, which is 8 times 1,460 bytes, divided by the round trip time and the square root of the loss. So what we've done in this case, instead of showing you all the wiggly lines, I've actually just fitted trend lines to each, each, of, the, uh, each of the things. And what we see is uh, lines which are exponentially increasing. The left-hand axis is, 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 exponential, is uh, a log scale. And you see that uh, the, the yellow line shows you an improvement of 20% or a factor of 10, 20% uh, per year or a factor of 10 in 12 years. So you see again that you have the uh, developed regions such as Aus Australasia, East Asia and Europe are coming together. They're pretty much, the, uh, pretty much equal now in terms of uh, performance, in terms of throughput in kilobits per second. And the second tier would be Russia, uh, Middle East, Latin America, and so on. And then right down at the bottom is Africa. And if you, let's see if I can do it. Okay, so down at the bottom is Africa. Now, if, if you extrapolate Africa, draw, draw a flat line back from where Africa is in uh, uh, in, 2000, in, in, in January 2011, and you, you extrapolate a flat line back and then see where the European line hits it, you get back to 1992. So Africa is roughly 18 years behind uh, Europe in terms of its performance. And worse still, if you look at the, little, the, the, the line for Africa, not only is it way behind, it actually is improving at a slower rate than the other countries, so it's actually falling further behind, such that at the current rate, this is in 2010, it would be 70 times worse than Europe in 10 years. One of the, one of the measurement is the mean opinion score, which is the, uh, how good does a, a, a phone work? And if you have, a, if you have a, a, a mean opinion score of five, then it's a perfect hi-fi reception. If you have a, min, a, a mean, mean opinion score of, say, less than around uh, two to three, then it's very poor. And if it's less than that, you can't understand what's going on at all. So this is, again, the uh, regions of the world and how they've been doing. You can see that in the 2000, uh, 2000 2002, a lot of countries got a lot better and that was because many of them moved from satellite to land links. Uh, you can see again that North America, Europe, uh, and uh, Oceania or Australia are at the top. Uh, other co most countries, basically if you've got a, a mean, mean opinion score of greater than about uh, 3.5, you can, you can do voice over IP fine over, over the internet. Um, as it falls below that, it begins to get bad. So you can see that uh, recently that South Asia and Central Asia have been able to make calls and Africa is beginning to be uh, uh, able to make calls. Now that obviously, when, it, when you say Africa, Africa is a huge place and this, this is measured for the whole of Africa. So some parts of Africa are much better than that, but on the other hand, some parts of Africa are much worse than that. <coughs> so the next thing is I mentioned fiber when I started out. Now, in 2008, the countries shown on the right uh, in red had uh, round trip times of, gre of greater than 400 milliseconds. And those, all those countries at that time only had geostationary satellite access. If you, if you take the time to go up to, the, up to the satellite, back down, and for the response to come back, that's 24,000 miles, you divide by the speed of light to 186,000 miles an hour, do your arithmetic, you come out with roughly 450 milliseconds, is the minimum round trip time for a geostationary satellite. Uh, so then, uh, um, the, okay, so there was, 
they give good, good coverage, of course, but uh, they're, they're expensive and they're long delays. Um, if, you look at, if, then, if you look at the long delays, the, the, the bottom left, what you see is um, the round trip time is plotted on the left hand axis. The little red line shows you the roughly 500 milliseconds. So countries which are in dark blue are, had geostationary satellites. Countries which are in the light blue are terrestrial. You can see that most of the countries with uh, satellite links were in, in Africa. Then there's the cost. This graph shows you for various countries or various regions of the world what the cost is. The uh, light blue shows the cost for a megabit per second in 2009 for in US dollars. And you can see that sub-Saharan Africa took the lead in the cost. If, if you then take a look at the orange line, that shows you that cost in terms of the earnings of the person. And it just goes off scale. You know, the monthly cost was, ru was roughly 810% of the typical uh, uh, earnings of the person in, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so, let's see. Um, I was going to do a demo, but unfortunately I couldn't get the... Uh, uh, the thing connected up, so I'm going to have to wing this little bit, a little bit. Um, let's see, what have I got to the next slide? All right, demo. Um, oh, yes, okay, let me back up. So <coughs> you can also compare the Pinger throughput measurements with measurements made by the uh, ITU for the, uh, it, um, for the Information Computing and Technology Development Index, which is an index which measures the readiness of a country to uh, take, be, be, be get, evolve into the internet, uh, its usage and its skills. The readiness is measured by infinite in infrastructure inf uh, access. In other words, number of phones, subscriptions, international bandwidth, percent of households with computers, percent of households with internet access. And the usage uh, is measured uh, is by the percent of the population who are in, in internet users, the number, percent of mobile users and, percent, and fixed broadband users, and then the skills, uh, literacy, secondary and tertiary education. You put those all together, you get an index. Uh, I think it runs from zero to one. Unfortunately, I can't do the demo. Uh, but then what you see is a graph that looks like this. Uh, the graph in this case shows you the countries as a bubble, uh, the size of the bubble, is the population of the country. So the two enormous bubbles there are, are, um, are China and uh, India, a lot of other smaller bubbles. The left-hand axis shows you the normalized throughput. The bottom axis shows you the IDI, IDI index, which runs from uh, uh, one, uh, I think it's one to 10. Uh, numbers on the right are good, numbers on the left are bad. So Ethiopia has a very low IDI index. Uh, it's very, very poorly positioned to actually uh, make, make a lot of progress. What you see is that there is actually a, a fairly reasonable correlation between the two low values of IDI result in low values of throughput. And the nice thing about this is we can make quick measurements of what's going on the internet because we don't need an army of data gatherers and statisticians, statisticians as the ITU does. Our, our measurements are probably less accurate, but they're much quicker to get. And they're more up to date. For example, the IDI most recent data is 2007. It was published in 2009. And there's reasonable validation. And also anomalies are interesting. So what is happening in Africa? Well, up until 2009, you had the picture in your top right. That shows you Africa with one cable running down the west coast. That was the SAT-3 cable. It was costly because there was no competition. They were charging basically satellite rates in terms of dollars per uh, megabit. And, it, and uh, it only covered the west coast, nothing on the east coast of Africa. In 2010, the World Football, Football Cup happened in uh, South Africa. And there was a scramble to provide fiber optic connections to South Africa, both for the east and west coast. Multiple providers meant you had competition, both on the east and west coast. New cables went in. CECOM, uh, Teams, Main One and Easy are already in production. On the east coast, it's Easy and CECOM. Competition once again. And prices are coming down. Um, let me skip that one. So what's the impact of this? Well, we measured uh, what was going on at the time. As I said, we, we have round trip measurements. The left hand axis of the lift little graph at the left is actually the round trip time. The bottom axis is time. 
So what you see is a, a blue line which shows you the uh, round trip time as a time series. And then the, yellow back, the, the light blue and yellow background shows you what the losses are. So uh, a, a light blue means low loss, less than 1%. Uh, a a uh, yellow means uh, 0 to 2.5% 2 and, and so on. So you see that uh, what happened on uh, August the 1st, 2009 at 2300 hours, all of a sudden the round trip time dropped from 720 milliseconds to 325 milliseconds. And then for a little while it ran at that, and then one of the, one of the links, either the outbound link or the inbound link, uh, had to go back to using satellites, so the round trip time went up, and then it dropped down again, and ran, has been running steadily ever since uh, at that rate. Uh, so this improved the round trip time by a factor of 2.2. The losses were reduced. You can see to the left of the first drop, there's a fair amount of yellow in there. To the right, it's uh, less yellow. You can also see, uh, not quite so dramatically, there's a lot of diurnal variation to the left, uh, day-night kind of things. It becomes maybe a little bit less. Maybe I'm being hopeful there. So not only the losses reduces and throughput and the uh, round trip reduced, but also means the throughput is increased because of this dependence on the uh, inverse uh, round trip time and the square root of the loss. Uh, this is seen from Trieste in Italy instead, and this is uh, measured to Kenya again. Again, August the second, you can see it was running at around uh, 780 milliseconds. Now, since Kenya is closer, I mean. At that time, you were using the satellite, so it didn't matter where you were measuring from. But then uh, they dropped to 225 instead of, in our case, about 350 milliseconds because it's closer. Um, and uh, they ran along like that. And then there was a, a lot of noise while they were uh, stabilizing things, still big, big diurnal changes. And then it seems to stabilize as things, things, things uh, got, got going. Other countries involved, Angola in mid-May, you can see dropped from 750 to 450. Zambia, uh, first of all, went in one direction, and then there were a lot of bounces as they tried to get the other direction going. Uh, Tanzania, also dramatic reduction in losses. You can see there's an awful lot of red to the left. And then uh, after September 27th, there were still some losses, but uh, the, it's very, very smooth, meaning little congestion, and uh, is running at uh, much less the throughput. Uh, Uganda is now inland, so it's not just the coastal countries. Uh, they they uh, first of all dropped to one direction, then both directions. And Rwanda also got connected through Uganda and through um, uh, Kenya, there's uh, still many sites to connect. Uh, so the next steps are obviously to go inland. Um, this, at the bottom left, you see how the easy cable uh, is getting, first of all, to Nairobi, onto the capital of, uh, of uh, Uganda, and then into, um, into uh, Rwanda. And they're going to have a, have a loop so that uh, you'll, be able to, you'll be able to go in. So if one link gets cut, you'll have link, links in both directions. The fibers are already in place. So that happened very fast. There's a very nice map from Ubuntu Net of inter-Africa fiber network connections. And you can see there are an enormous number of actually fibers within Africa, which will be needed. They do exist. Most universities are located fairly close to the uh, fibers existing. So that means the capitals and many of the universities will get connected. An example of what's, what will happen is, is, is the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The West African cable system cable uh, landed in Moanda, which is on the coast of uh, uh, the Democratic Republic, and in Point Noir, which is the next country up, which is Congo Brazzaville, on, Feb on February, February 2011. There's already a 10 gigabit fiber to the capital in Kinshasa, 637 kilometers away. Fibers under construction to Bratzaville. There will be a cable across the river Congo to Bratzaville. Uh, the DRC, the Digital Republic of uh, Congo, their NREN plans to connect 15 Kinshasa universities by fiber in 2011, December of this year. And if you think of it today, that unit, one of those universities has 200, sorry, 26,000 students, eight public IP addresses for the whole site. One and a half megabits per second download, 512 per kilobits per second upload, less than most of people probably have in your home right now. And that's serving 26,000 students. So big changes are in store. The next steps are obviously beyond fiber's reach. 
So once one has the basic infrastructure in place, fi fiber to the cities, and you can carry the traffic to millions of users, then one needs the last mile to connect up those millions of users. And one can do this with their cell phones and with their um, Wi-Fi. In areas where fiber is not, not, connect, uh, not, connect, not available, which will be an enormous number of uh, rural areas, the main contenders are uh, wireless, in particular microwave, cell phone towers, WiMAX. There was an attempt, and I'm not sure whatever came of it, but to put up low Earth orbiting satellites, uh, which Google signed up with Liberty Global and HSBC, uh, in and, and hoped to have it going in 2010, but I've seen nothing about that, so I hope somebody can tell me what's happening there. That'd be great. But then you've got low Earth, uh, the low Earth orbiting satellites are only about 100, 200 miles up, so they're much shorter round trip time. And there was even somebody talking about putting up weather balloons and then reflecting the signals off the weather balloons. Now, this isn't going to help in the, in the deep forests or places where your coverage to the, uh, to the sky is blocked, but it does help in a lot of areas. So the next steps are getting together, and this is happening, uh, getting the leaders such as universities, academic establishments, because they're teaching the teachers to get together to form NRENs for countries. You can see there are many NRENs already in uh, Africa. The yellow is the emerging ones. This was in 2010. Uh, the, there were new ones in 2008 to 2010 were in yellow, and the established ones before 2008 were in, are in blue. But the, these NRENs can then bargain for cheaper rates. So the bandwidth, as I mentioned already, in, in, uh, is most expensive in Africa well, uh, compared to any, anywhere else in the world. It is dropping by a factor of two. And then the NRENs get together to create international exchange points uh, to avoid what has been happening until now, where traffic from Africa, most of, between most African countries up until 2009, almost all traffic uh, was going to, directly to the neighboring country and then beyond that, it would go via Europe or the US. And so that was paying international rates, which was very expensive. Uh, Ubuntu Net has been founded, in particular covering East and Central uh, Africa. And that now has connections to Géant, which connects to Europe. And Géant then peers with uh, uh, the, the US, Internet2, and the other, other networks like that. So that, that gets that going. So let me uh, just wrap up. There are many problems, They're by no means all have evolved. Uh, electricity, I know electricity is very good here. I, was just I just came down from Kinshasa and pretty much every day we'd lose power for some of the day. Luckily they had uh, diesel, diesel generators, but it was, uh, electricity was a problem. And only if, you, only if you had diesel generators and they were ready to go, were you okay? There are the skills, people are getting training. There's obviously diseases, war and poverty and conflict. A lot of conf uh, protectionist policies uh, and corruption. And the current providers, uh, the cable and satellite, have a lot to use, and many of these have close links to regulators and governments. For example, I believe over 50% of the ISPs in Africa are government controlled. The attractions, of course, are there's an enormous market, a billion people, and they're very young in, many, in, most, case, in most countries. That, that, there's a good reason for that, which is not too good, but you know, it does mean there's a, a market is dying to get good connectivity. And the internet is, of course, a great enabler in the information age. The, the fiber coming to sub-Saharan Africa has a great potential to help catch up and leap forward. There's still last mile problems and uh, network fragility. By leaping forward, I mean wireless is replacing wired. Uh, I think when I was in Kinshasa, I saw one fixed phone, and I would guess that most, I don't know about most, but a, lo a lot of people, uh, hundreds, you know, you know, uh, all had uh, uh, um, cell phones or mobile phones. And so that, that's really taking off there, and they're just going to bypass. And also, you know, moving to iPads and uh, smartphones instead of uh, and the OLPC, the one-line laptop per child. You know, people are bypassing the whole steps of having a desk side computer and things like that. The African international bandwidth has actually increased 14-fold between 2006 and 2010. Prices are coming down, not as fast as hoped, but it's a long way to go. There's still a long way to go. For example, Africa combined has less than one-third as much international uh, 
capacity is just one country in Europe, Austria. Um, let me just see if I missed anything. Um, this, this is one other thing to worry about is multiple routes. This was uh, in the, Medi the Mediterranean fiber cuts that happened in January 2008 and December 2008. What is shown on the right is kind of like a contour map. Along the bottom axis is the, uh, um, the date. Uh, and you can see red, blue, red, green are, 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 are high, so to speak. So in other words, the throughput was high. The blue is kind of like sea level. And you can see that on, uh, I think it's the 19th of December 2008, everybody drops into the sea because the fiber got cut um, in the uh, Western Mediterranean. And countries went offline or reduced their bandwidth by over 50% to, to 20 countries, and it took days to recover. So one needs to make sure that there is multiple routes. Um, I think I'll, I'll stop at that, and uh, if there's any questions, uh, I'll take the questions. I, I see you've got 1460 as the packet size. Um, I'm wondering how you got to that number, and, and if that number is consistent across various countries, um, considering the difference in um, technologies. Um, my understanding is that most, most uh, TCP implementations today do an MTU uh, to find the maximum transfer unit and typically come up with uh, f roughly you know, 1,500 byte packets of, and 1,460 is after you've taken out the header. Um, a few people with old implementations are probably using maybe the, f the old 512 limit, but uh, pretty much I would think you would find over 90% of TCP packets are going to be 14, 1460 bytes.